Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Apex Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Apex Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação. A Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse a Apex Brasil.
Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Pets Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Pets Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação, a Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse a Apex Brasil.
Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Apex Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Apex Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação. A Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o um mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse a Apex Brasil. Good afternoon and welcome to the closing ceremony of the fourth Be Best Second Biofuture Summit Joint Conference. We start this session with a talk by Professor Luiz Eugenio Mello, the Scientific Director of FAPESP. Professor Mello, it's a great honor to have you with us. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Hello, my name is Luiz Mello and I am the Scientific Director of FAPESP. I would like to start by thanking you all for such an excellent event and for the participation of so many distinguished speakers and panelists in the area of bioenergy in this fourth edition of the Brazilian Bioenergy Science and Technology Conference, Be Best. The discussions that we had in the past three days will certainly help in advancing the field and it will be strategic to the implementation of the FAPES BioN plan for the next decade. The idea with this presentation is to give you a brief overview about FAPESP and to highlight some aspects that illustrate the relevance of the agency in the innovation system in the state of Sao Paulo and in the country at large. Created in 1962, FAPESP is a public organization funded by Sao Paulo taxpayers to promote the development of science and technology in the state. FAPESP funding comes from 1% of all state tax revenue as established in the state constitution, which is stable and non-political. It funds all scientific areas of knowledge. And in the past 20 years, it has devised a number of strategic programs to foster research in specific themes, including the BioN program. The research and development investment in the state is very diverse and it is interesting to highlight the contribution of companies and universities for this scenario. Research funding agencies account for approximately 10% of the total amount. The expenditure in 2018 was around $500 million in purchasing power parities. In most of Europe, North America, and in many Asian countries, investment in R&D is mainly performed by the private sector. This is not true for most of the emerging economies in which academic institutions respond for most of the effort on R&D. For the state of Sao Paulo, despite having the largest and likely the best academic institutions in the country, over 57% of the R&D effort is performed outside academic institutions. To foster this key aspect of academy industry partnerships, FAPESP has launched a number of initiatives. The most recent of these was created in 2015, the FAPESP Engineering Research Centers. This program links real world company challenges, ideally at low levels of technology readiness level, with co-funding from both industry, universities, and FAPESP. 
with researchers from academic institutions in the state of Sao Paulo. Since the creation of these engineering research centers, FAPESP has invested more than 1 billion reais in 10 centers. To name one of the many excellent examples that we have for research centers, we have the New Energy Innovation Center, CINI, in partnership with Shell BG. This year, it started the operation of the first manufacture of prototypes of supercapacitors and batteries in the pouch scale, rectangular cells of five by seven centimeters in the Southern Hemisphere. The manufacturing is installed at the Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Unicamp. They expect to soon start producing prototypes of lithium ion batteries and alternative materials, such as sodium, potassium, and zinc, which can contribute precisely to safer, cleaner, and cheaper energy storage and release systems. Further, on the topic of strategic programs, FAPESP has three programs that interface with bioenergy, the BioN program, BIOTA, and the Global Climate Change programs. These three were responsible for the production of the book Scope, Bioenergy and Sustainability. This was a collective effort with contributions from 137 researchers of 82 institutions in 24 countries that pointed out paths and recommendations for the sustainable expansion of bioenergy that are being picked by many policymakers around the globe. This highlights the relevance of FAPESP's programs for the international debate on bioenergy and sustainability. More recently, research under the BioN program has indicated that the production of sugarcane for the production of ethanol has taken science and technology to regions of the state of Sao Paulo, where there was not even a structure to produce food, improving rural conditions. Bioenergy brought better education and better revenues for municipalities. A study on the effects of investments in human capital in agriculture in the state of Sao Paulo has shown that for each one real invested in research and development, higher education and rural extension, this resulted in a return of 12 reais for the state, uh, for the Sao Paulo state economy through productivity growth. The work led by researchers from the University of Sao Paulo also looked at the contribution of funding agencies and of those that generate and disseminate knowledge and uh, their impact on the productive sector. In the case of FAPESP investments, the survey indicated that the resources allocated by the foundation to scholarships, research projects, and infrastructures in the fields of agronomy and agriculture produce a return not of 1 to 12, but of 1 to 27 for each real invested. To conclude, I would like to once more congratulate the organizers of this important event and, of course, to thank the FAPES BioN program together, so many relevant players in this relevant discussion. Bioenergy is important for the state of Sao Paulo and for the world, and FAPES will keep supporting excellent research in this field. FAPES will also keep looking for the best options to make the produced knowledge available for the development of new technologies and new public policies on the team. Thank you and have a great uh, event. Thank you, Professor Mello, and please accept our sincere thanks for FAPESP's support of this conference and of the BioN program. Friends, I'm very pleased to say we were able to achieve our goals of bringing together scientists and policymakers to discuss the future of bioenergy. We had over 500 participants in this virtual event. Our conference had to be postponed for May next year, but we did not want to postpone the important discussions that had to take place at this moment when we are having to plan for a post-COVID recovery that can bring back our economies better with bio. When we decided to organize this intermediate event, there was another important reason behind it. Our economies may be slow, policy may be slow, but our students work fast. 
they can't wait. The science and technology they are developing is the main driver for us coming together and a good one that brought up many opportunities for networking. I now start the Be Best Awards ceremony. I would like to invite Luisiana Ferreira, Clarissa Foretti, and Marcelo Menossi, the general secretaries of the conference, to host the awarding. It appears uh, Louisiana is mute. Uh, no, can uh, we switch the order and go into the next uh, speaker perhaps? Or Louisiana, can you try to open your mic? It is open. Yes. Okay, so can we switch, switch the order? and uh, moving to the next uh, uh, member of the panel. Okay, Clarissa, are you there? <laughs> no? Okay, Menasi. Okay. Okay. So, yes. That's okay. great. That's so, great. That's my pleasure. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'm very pleased to announce the finalists of the category doctorate, right? Wow. That's, that's marvelous. Congratulations, Igor Severo Gonçalves, Fernanda Silva Martinelli, and Natalia Vilela for your work. And now let's watch the video poster from the three finalists. My name is Igor Severo, PhD student at the Faculty of Food Engineering at the University of Campinas, Brazil. I will present the work entitled Increase in Sugar Can Strapper Treatment Efficiency Using Ionic Liquid Mixture at Low Temperature and the Supervision of Professor Marcos Forte. One application of a way of ionic liquids is for lignocellulose feedstock pretreatment, the capacitor to break hydrogen bonds within lignocellulose and selectively solubilize its components or desirable for biofinery applications. Biomass is composed of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and the pretreatment has the function of breaking the structure of the biomass to increasing the digestibility of cellulose and hemicellulose for fuel production. This work explored the potential of the ionic liquids to hydroxyethanol ammonium acetate to hydroxyethanol ammonium hexanoate and their mixture for lignocellulose pretreatment. Sugar canister was pretreated with pure ionic liquids and with the mixture of them. The pretreatment conditions were solid loading 6% for 20 hours and enzymatic hydrolysis was carried at 5% of solid loading for 48 hours. The chemical composition was determined according to annual methodology. Mia acetate showed a better capacity to print the sugar can straw in comparison to Mia hexanoate. Lignin removal was around the percent for pure ironic liquids. Ironic liquid mixture solubilized 25% of total lignin to 0.5 folds higher than <coughs> pure ironic liquid. The tasted ironic liquid showed great potential for sugar canister treatment. 
their mixture maintained the enzymatic digestibility efficiency and had a better performance on the lignification than pure ironic liquids without changing the processual conditions. We would like to thank Unicamp, FEA and LEMEB for development of research and founding agencies, CNPq, FAPESP and BBASIC. Thank you. Thank you for choosing uh, to watch this presentation. My name is Fernanda Martinelli. I'm here to talk to you about biofuel policy um, and sustainability using the SDG framework. Let's go. And what is this SDG framework? They are the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that all countries agreed um, to follow and to achieve by 2030. And uh, bioenergy actually could contribute to achieve these goals. Um, bioenergy can um, decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It's a low cost technology, can provide energy security to a country. So there are um, advantages for sustainability there, but there are also negative impacts. For example, um, land use change emissions um, uh, biodiversity loss, competition with food crops. So we must address what are the impacts of bioenergy for sustainability. And in this study, we chose to pursue biofuel policy, Renova Bio as a case study to analyze the potential impact of this policy on the SDGs, especially focusing on the SDG targets. So to do that, we asked experts through an online survey last year to tell us what what are the SDGs that they think they are going to be more uh, impacted by the policy, and the result shows that uh, the, the SDG 2, 15, 1, and 12 they are the SDGs most impacted by renewable bio and the targets that are related with climate technology. They are the ones that will be supported while social and environmental targets could be restrained. In general, there were a positive um, uh, point of view about the policy for sustainability and scientists were the most optimists on that. Among the experts, they agreed on topics for climate, social economy and technology, but they disagreed on the other hand about biodiversity, health and water, which reveals a polarization of opinions about among them about the risks. So we conclude that the um, decarbonization and economic boosts are the benefits that everybody agreed and the benefits are clear, but the negative impacts remain controversial, especially because probably uh, because of the sustainability gaps and the uncertain enforcement of the eligibility criteria and environmental risks should be addressed for monitoring this policy. Um, that's it. Thank you for watching and let me know if you have any questions. Hello everyone, my name is Natalia Vilela. I'm a PhD student at UNICAMP and UNICEF, and today I will present part of my PhD project. So those PhD species are a basidium set is that have a, that can accumulate lipids and carotenoid pigments. They also have a good tolerance to inhibitor compounds commonly found in lignin cellulose biomass hydrolysate and are able to metabolize lignin. With these characteristics and knowing that omega protein and hydropool screenings may reveal novel pathways and enzyme sets, we characterize how the sporidium fluviale is using genome transcriptomic and secretomic analysis. This species was previously isolated from a lignin degraded microorganism consortium. So for that, we extract the total DNA for a second generation sequence and the transcriptomic and secretomic analysis 
for the transcriptomic and secretomic analysis, we cultivate the cells in a lignin containing medium. We also analyze the ferric acid catabolism by a mass spectrometry analysis. About the results, the Podosporidium fluviali has a genome of 15 megabases with 17,000 protein coding genes. 400 of those predicted genes encode the enzymes as LPMO and peroxidase, and 300 encode a prefundament related to a meta compound degradation. About this transcriptomic analysis, we identified some important lignolytic enzymes as peroxidase and beta ethyrase with a differential gene expression when the yeast was cultivated in lignin. We also identified other genes as ABC transport and macular protein that suggest uh, lignin, pros, lignin, lignin degradation process induces a stress response in Rhodosporidium fluvial. The secretomic analysis identifies gly glyoxoxidase enzymes, which assist an extracellular lignin degradation process. About the veruc acid catabolism, we observed at 12 hours of cultivation that Rhodosporidium fluvial converts ferulic acid in 4 vinyl glycol and vanillin, probably by a decarboxylation process using a phenolic acid decarboxylase. Summer, this is the first published genome for Rhodosporidium fluvial, which uh, showed important lignolytic enzymes that act in lignin degradation process. Thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you all. Well, and now, finally, we have the winner. And it's my pleasure to announce that Natalia Vilela is the winner of this category. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, well, feel free to say a thank few words. You. How do you feel? I, first, I would like to thank you, the BBS Organized Committee, for the opportunity. And I'm very glad to receive this award. For us students, it's particularly important to when we have our hard work recognized, especially in this difficult year. And I also I also like to thank my supervisor for all the support and my co-workers that helps me every day. Thank you. Great, great. We know it was a difficult year, but congratulations yeah. again. Now we go back to Louisiana. Hello. I hope you are listening to me now. Yes. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so let's start again. Welcome to the numbers. I will give you some numbers how we reach to the uh, Be Best 2020 and Biofuture Summit Best Poster Awards. I must tell you that in this first slide, I will inform you that we have approved, after a first evaluation, a total of 148 abstracts to be presented in the poster session. They were, they were submitted by each author under one of the five areas described here. A, biomass, agronomy, breeding, other energy crops, biotechnological aspects of plants, feedstocks. B, biofuel technologies, including biomass process engineering and biofuels production. C, biorefineries, biobased chemicals and biomass and biomaterials. D, biofuels engines and application to aviation. And E, sustainability, environment, social, economic, and public policy issues. On behalf of the conference organization, first of all, congratulations to each one of the authors for sharing and for opening your research results to scientific discussion in this forum. This step is one of the most essential contributions for the success of our conference. Thank you very much. Now, if I can have the next slide, 
I would like to remember that because of the current pandemic restrictions, which prohibit in-person meetings, in the next step, we posted a new challenge to each author, that is to record a three-minute video summarizing each work. Again, each work submitted now as a video was analyzed and polished, if needed, to improve technical aspects such as video lamp, images, sound, lightning, quality, and etc. Next step, they were already released to all the attendees to be assessed through Hoover. And I have followed very interesting discussions among participants, even before the official opening conference. In fact, if you go to the leaderboard at Hoover, you will find the three most active members of our community, which I congratulated and encouraged them to keep uh, the discussions and contacts for the future. It's been hard to beat you, I tried, and uh, if you go to the Hoover, you see that we have uh, Wiraja, Rui, and Daniel as the most active. Congratulations to, to you. Finally, to award the best works, uh, scientific analysis was performed by the evaluation committee, which are listed in the next slide, please. So, as you can see, we have a number of evaluators from different uh, universities and research centers. Uh, we thank you very much to all the evaluators, to, to all the evaluators that contributed in this process. Uh, which was under the coordination of Professor Flavia Vink, to whom we all give our best thanks. Uh, videos were evaluated according to the four categories listed in the next slide, please. Undergraduate work, master student, doctoral student, or postdoc videos. And now, it is my pleasure to start announcing the finalists in the category of undergraduate video posters. The finalists are Manuela Tentempes de Carvalho, Tainá Fagotti Ferreira, and Jonathan Cardoso Clima Covieira. Congratulations to all. Watch again your video poster then. Hello, I'm Manuela from La Debu FRJ and I'll present the work entitled Evaluation of Metallocystic Suta Growth in a Steamer Tank and Bubble Column Bioreactor with our evaluation of culture medium and gas phase recycle. Metanotrophic bacteria are microorganisms capable of using methane as a source of carbon and energy. The ability to consume a greenhouse gas makes them promising fermentative agent for the generation of food supplement for both animals and humans. Their present works aim to compare methylocystic suta growth using methane as carbon source, exploring aspects relating to the conduction of the bioprocess and the type of bioreactor. ACES were performed on sewer tank and bubble column bioreactor with a new system of three vessels de de developed at Bio using pair ring to fill the BCR system. Different types of air MFM supply were tested, using or not recycling in the yeast air ACES. Variation in the culture media of BCR ACES was also done, aiming to improve the solubilization of methane in the liquid phase and the supplementation of the media to improve growth rates of microorganisms. Results obtained in yeast air showed that the higher efficient of the recycled system in cell growth. Recycled ACES present a five-time increase in final concentration, while not recycled ACES show one and two-time increase. 
the concentration obtained in BCR were 1.1 and 2.1 gram per liter with a pure mineral medium and yeast extract and casamino acid supplement median respectively. Acid 1 yeast extract and casamino acid supplement median plus mineral oil exhibit a cell concentration of 5.5 grams per liter, the higher volume obtained so far. The final cell concentration obtained in BCR system put, in, put it as an official new configuration of bioreact to cultive methanotrophic bacteria, with a significant competitive advantage for the reduction of operational cost on mechanical agitation, if not necessary. Further experiments should be performed to open optimize cell production in the two system, but both have shown promising in the utilization of methane as a substrate by the microorganisms in, the de in their efficient mass transform to the liquid phase. We'd like to thank Professor Ney and Professor Persanya for the val valuable advice during the, 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 the lab of these works, and CAPS and CMPK for the scholarships. Thanks and bye-bye. Hi, my name is Taina. I am an undergraduate student in an interdisciplinary bachelor's degree in science and technology at the Federal University of Alfa. I make scientific initiation in the effluent treatment area. First, it is important to talk about the dairy industries, which are responsible for generating significant amounts of effluent with a high organic load and milk processing nutrients, which are extremely polluting if discarded without proper treatment. Thus, this work proposes the simultaneous of hypolytic fungal cells with anaerobic sludge for the treatment of dairy wastewater, integrating the action of hypolytic enzymes presenting fungal cells and anaerobic sludge to reduce organic load and increase fungal cells were prepared using the filamentous fungus PC through the culture medium was composed of carbon source and nitrogen source and supplemented with salts. A sample of this power suspension in August was 82 flasks containing of culture medium kept in a shaking bath for growth. The cells were separated from the medium by vacuum filtration and dried. The hybrid treatment was carried out in a heated flasks containing milk effluent at pH 7, adjusted with sodium bicarbonate together with anaerobic sludge and dry cells. Biogas was measured every two hours. Two conditions and quantities used are described in the flow chart. The results in figure 1 show that the hybrid system increased the production of biogas by 53% compared to the control experiment without cells. The use of cells grown in residual oil and soy plankton provided the greatest production of biogas. It will be concluded that the results of this study reveal the benefits of hybrid wastewater treatment for diet methane production. In addition, Holy fungal cells of have been successfully grown in low cost ways and provide an increase in biogas production. Additional studies are being conducted to optimize the hybrid anaerobic treatment using the whole cells. I would like to thank Papamix and Began Caps for the financial support provided to carry out. Hi, welcome to my poster. My name is Jonathan and I'm going to talk about the evaluation of cell wall components of contrasting sugarcane proteins for biomass production. Sugarcane bioethanol can be divided into two types, the first generation ethanol and the second generation. The first one is derived from sucrose fermentation for the juice, 
while the second one derives from lignin cellulose material, which is the result of pre-treatments on the baguette, such as enzymatic hydrolysis to obtain fermentable sugars. The bagasse used for 2G ethanol production consists of cellulose, hemicellulose, lignins, and pectins, which are part of the plant cell wall. The fibrous rearrangement make up three different domains, cellulose, hemicellulose, and pectins. The first two domains are bonded together by molecular interactions, and both are embedded in a pectin matrix. This architecture results in a structure resistant to mechanical breaks and also to enzymatic hydrolysis, which makes it harder to achieve all the potential fermentable sugars that are within the cell wall an obstacle when it comes to second-generation ethanol production. Thereby, this project intends to compare contrasting proteins for biomass production and check for possible differences between cell wall compositions, aiming the development of new varieties for greater use in cellulose ethanol production. And also, we hope that our data can increase databases related to cell wall features for future projects. Forty genotypes were analyzed. 31 of them are a result of crosses between sugarcane commercial varieties and sugarcane ancestors, such as Saccharum, Ficinarum, Spontaneum, and Robustum. Two of them are sugarcane commercial varieties. Two of them are energy cane varieties, and five of them are sugarcane ancestor species. All the samples were collected 80 months after planting. It was performed these five protocols to measure cell features. Looking at glucose content generated by enzymatic saccharification process, it is shown that sacrification capacity assessed by the 40 distinct genotypes are not statistically significant. When it comes to lignin content, it is observed a similar situation. These observations can indicate that the features are well conserved and the different process didn't affect the new genotype cell composition directly. It was performed a principal component analysis comparing only the commercial varieties, the energy canes, and the ancestor species, with data related to all cell features and it is possible to see clusters formations to each one of the groups, indicating correlations between them and the nearest axis. In conclusion, it was observed that cell wall features are well conserved since our data didn't show significant differences between the party proteins. The different crosses didn't affect the digital type cell wall composition directly. With that, the focus in future works could change to biomass accumulation for greater efficiency in obtaining lignocellulosic hitanol. If you want to hear more about it, feel free to contact me. This work is part of a FAPESP thematic project in which we are studying the signaling and regulatory network associated to energy gain. If you are interested in this topic, here are some other abstracts from our group. Thank you very much for the attention and have a great conference. Very well. And now, it's my pleasure to announce that the winner is Jonathan Vieira. Congratulations, Jonathan. Please, would you have a, a word to say to the audience, please? Thank you, thank you. It's an honor to receive this award and being here, sharing my work with everyone. I would like to thank my group lab from USP, Transmissão Transmissão de Sinal Lab. Thank you, Professor Glaucia, for being my coordinator of research and introducing me to the science world. Augusto for helping me a lot through this project and all the group for welcoming me in the lab. I'm really grateful. I also would like to thank our lab partners from Mona Lisa's lab in UFSCar and from the Bucarides lab in Biosciences Institute in USP. Thank you, Adriana, Deborah, Marina, and the others for all the support during this year. And thank you, FAPESP, for the financial support. I also would like to thank the best organizers for this great event. And I hope you all enjoyed my video poster and the conference. Have a great day. Thank you. Very nice work and very nice video. Now, to announce the next award, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Clarissa Forecki from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Brazil. Thank you, Luciana. I must say it was a great pleasure to finally hear from you. I hope you can hear me as well. Uh, it is my turn to announce the finalists in the master's category. So the finalists are Flavia da Silva Barbosa, Luca Bonge e Cuti Mansi, before I announce the winner.
Hi everyone, my name is Flavia and I'm going to introduce this beautiful poster entitled Soya Bean Oil Extraction Using Ethanol Oil Solvent Effect of Moisture of Oligen Solids in Temperature of Extraction. Brazil became the first producer of soybean with a production of approximately 37 year old. And from the extraction, the main products obtained are the defeated meal and soybean oil. Conventionally, hexane is the solvent used in the process of extraction, and it has some disadvantages, such as it comes from no renewable source and presents high flammability, for example. So, some studies point ethanol as a good substitute, since it comes from renewable source, presents low toxicity, reduced environmental impact, and low cost. However, ethanol shows low solubility with triacylglycerols. So, this study aims the substitution of hexane by absolute ethanol in the process of soybean oil extraction. The raw materials are soybean colors with two levels of moisture, which are 3 and 6%, and absolute ethanol is a solvent. The process was accomplished in a fixed bed column under 60 and 70 degrees Celsius and solid to solvent mass ratio 1 to 1.5. From the result, the best yield of extraction were obtained for the process using soybean colors with 3% moisture, first for the temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, where the yield of extraction was approximately 72%, followed by the temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, where the yield of extraction was approximately 61%. So, analyzing the effect of soybean colors moisture on the yield, for both temperature, the reduction from 6 to 3% increased the yield of extraction. So, the yield variation was positive, mainly for the temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, where the yield variation was approximately 77%. And also analyzing the effect of temperature on the yield, the rise of temperature from 60 to 70 increased the yield variation for both soybean colors moisture, mainly for the soybean colors containing 6% moisture, where the yield variation was approximately 31%. So it can be inferred that both temperature rise and reduction of moisture content in raw material improve the extraction of soybean oil using ethanol as a solvent. Thank you to the funding agents, the university and the lab. Hi there, my name is Luca, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about my research entitled Utilization of Hydrolysis Byproducts of Lignocellulosic Substrates in the Generation of Energy in a Microbial Fuel Cell, guided by Professor Valeria Reginati. So as we all know, biofuels are currently one of the best alternatives to fossil fuels, and current research has focused in the production of these fuels in the second generation, which is allowed by the saccharification techniques releasing sugars from cellulose and hemicellulose in the bagasse residues of the first generation, allowing for the fermentation process to continue and produce more biofuels. However, this process does release some organic acids and phenolic compounds, which can inhibit the fermenting bacteria. Meanwhile, these still are the preferred substrates of a number of anaerobic bacteria, including a special group that is capable of transferring its electrons to a solid electron acceptor or an electrode. Therefore, we decided to study the generation of electricity using microbial fuel cells fed with some of these byproducts, namely acetate and cumeric acid, which were chosen based on assays done by our group and based on the phenolic structure of cumeric acid, which is similar to some other natural electron shuttles. To study this, we inoculated a small microbial fuel cell anode with a mixed community in anaerobiosis, this was fed with acetate, which was oxidized by bacteria at the anode and generated electricity. The cathode was exposed to air and used oxygen as the final electron acceptor. We then gradually added cumeric acid up to a concentration of 0.1 millimolar. In terms of voltage, acetate was easily oxidized, but after the addition of cumeric acid, it dropped almost 20%. The substrate continued being consumed in high rates, and cumeric acid was also oxidized. But the efficiency of conversion from chemical into electrical energy also suffered a drop. The cyclic voltammetry analysis revealed that the chimeric acid addition does drop the reduction peaks and affects the activation energy. Instead of mediating electron transfer, it seemed that it inhibited the native mechanisms. 
The potential curve also showed that the maximum power density also dropped in about 20%, as was seen in the experiment. From this, we learned that humeric acid was consumed in oxidized, but it did not mediate electron transfer. It seemed to inhibit it. It also reduced the efficiency and capacity of voltage generation by about 20%. Still, microbial electrochemical technologies may render better strains for isolation and genetic tools for tolerance and oxidation gene studies, but we cannot use it as an efficient energy source. Lastly, I would like to thank my research group and the funding by Papeski, Sany Piquet, Capis, and thank you very much for watching. I'm Franz, a master's student, and my research is basically about production of the copolyester P2HV CO3HV by Buchoderia saccharae PRP mutants using silos and propionate. Under nutritional limitation, but using silos and propionate, Buchoderia saccharae produces a biodegradable and biocompatible copolymer, more flexible and with a wide range of applications. But production costs are still a drawback. Low yield are observed the two pathways that compete on propionate oxidation. The two methyl citric acid cycle and alpha oxidation prevents the propionyl CoA to form 3 HV units. Only two MCC was described, so our objective is to elucidate alpha oxidation role and how it affects copolymer production. Methodology Cultivation starts with an excess of silos, so when nitrogen source limit, accumulation of pH increases, so it provides propionate in order to produce the copolymer. Propionate and silos are quantified in HPLC, and for quantified pH, biomass is lyophilized and then propanolysis is analyzed in OCG. Strains As controls, LFM0101 is the white type and LFM019 is a 2MCC mutant. All PRP mutants are unable to grow in propionate, and alpha oxidation can't either grow intermediate as acetate, lactate, and pyruvate. For molecular studies, we have observed, we have obtained an alpha oxidation mutant by transposon section and screening. As a result, we observed the 3 HV content on copolymer have increased as much propionate has been provided, and yields are overall slightly higher, especially on lower concentration tests. Also, all oxidation mutants consume well propionate above 1 gram per liter, and LFM77 has no effects, any inhibitor effects are seen as in 2 MCC mutant. Reproducing a fat batch cultivation, LFM inferior values are reported for the two MCC mutants under similar conditions. We conclude that alpha oxidation mutants have improved on propionate consumption even on higher concentrations, elevating the 3 HV content. In opposite conditions, HV content are lower as in two MCC mutants, suggesting more activity in higher concentrations. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for watching. Once again, congratulations to the three of you for your work. And now, the winner is Flavia da Silva Barbosa. Congratulations, Flavia. You have the floor to say a few words now. Thank you, Clarissa. Thank you to the best members um, for the opportunity and the recognition of this product. Of course, I didn't work alone. So thank you to the group who works in the Separation Engineering Laboratory at the University of São Paulo in Piracinunga. A special thank you to my advisor, Cristiano Rodrigues, and the researcher, Maria Caterini, for the support, and also the fund agents, Cathy, Kenny Piccio, and Papesi for the financial support, Cara Muru for providing one of the raw materials, and the University of São Paulo. And finally, thank you to all that attended to my session and what they did. Thank you. And now, to announce the next award, it is my great pleasure to reintroduce Marcelo Menos. Okay, Clarissa, thank you very much. Well, now, finally, we are going to meet the finalists of the postdoctorate category.
Okay. Um, we uh, would like to thanks Livia Beatriz Brenelli, Matheus Aparecido Pereira Cipriano, and Juliane de Castro Oliveira. Uh, and now we are going to see the work again, please. everyone, my name is Liva Brenelli, I'm postdoctoral fellow at the Interdisciplinary Center of Energy Planning, and today I'm presenting the work that I have been developed in the joint FAPESP BBSRC project. We know that Brazil is the largest sugar can produce in the world, and as a result, a large amount of straw is produced every year. With a similar chemical composition to baguettes, green tops and dry leaves can be converted into value-added molecules and fermentable sugars to biofuels. In this way, my work aimed to develop a combined treatment to maximize the production of xylo-oligosaccharides from sugarcane straw and also test different xylanes to hydrolyze it in short oligomers. To reproduce optimum pretreatment conditions at the pallet scale, to generate a pretreated material suitable to be converted into cellulo-oligosaccharides, and finally to explore the potential of recovered lignins and phenolics generated during the pretreatment. To achieve these goals, a two-stage combined pretreatment was optimized at lab scale, which was mild alkaline and hydrothermal based on preliminary results. Afterwards, we selected enzymes to convert the sugars into short and linear xylo-oligosaccharides, and the pretreatment was reproduced in the pilot plant at LNBR. So here we have the input-output diagram of the combined pretreatment performing pallet scale and also all streams generated. From lab to pallet scale, xyloligomers yielded 9.8 and 9.1% from the initial amount of sugarcane straw and using a recombinant xylanase from Netherlands to hydrolyze the pretreated material, it was possible to increase by 20% the amount of xyloligomers uh, produced. More detailed data can be found in our articles published recently. As conclusion, we point out that the two-state optimized pretreatment was successfully demonstrated on a scale-up pilot plant reactor. I would like to acknowledge FAPES for the financial support and also LNBR and Lebimo for our infrastructure available. Thank you so much for your attention. My name is Matheus Cipriano, and today I'm presenting a work done by me and my group about interaction between sugarcane and beneficial microorganisms. As we know, beneficial microorganisms such as plant growth promoting bacteria and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are used in, this, in a sustainable agriculture. But we still have some questions to answer, especially in the sugarcane pre-sprouted seedling production. So our, our main goal was to evaluate these microorganisms regarding to these variables. And what we done was to characterize it, our strains bacteria in the lab uh, regarding the control of the pathogen in vitro testes and also some metabolites related to the, to the plant growth promoting. And also, we tested these bacteria strains and the AMF inoculated in the plants cultivated in greenhouse. Then we evaluated the nutritional state, biological control, plant biomass, and endophytic and rhizosphere bacterial community. And what we got, as you can see here in figure one, the plant biomass improvement in the plants treated with the bacteria. As you can see here in the left, the, some strains also control the incidence of pathogen in the shoots up to 40% of this pathogen. And also what we got here in the right is that the plant biomass was improved 
up to 80% and also have a good impact in the bacterial diversity community in the soil. And as you can see here in the center, some strains such as Cosacone applied together with AMF can improve the, nut the nutrient content up to 60%. So what we got is that our bacteria strains can improve sugar can do an array of mechanisms that modulate the nutrient use efficiency. And some strains such as Cosacone and Bacillus have a great synergistic effect with AMF, optimizing the sugar can growth. Other strains such as Parabrichoderia, Pseudomonas, Putida, and Bacillus reduce the incidence of Coletotricum in sugar cane plants. So what we got is that plant growth promoting bacteria and AMF are excellent alternative to conventional agriculture techniques to optimize sugar cane seedling production. Thank you all. Hello, my name is Juliane Oliveira and I will present the work titled Assessment of Pastoral Land Chains on the Net Primary Production Based Exergy in the São Paulo State, Brazil. Land use and land cover change is a relevant topic in the context of environmental change and sustainability at several spatial temporal scales. Pastoral lands is one type of land that cover around 3 billion hectares and have been considered for intensification potential, greenhouse gas emission mitigation, and bioenergy expansion. However, they are complex lands cover with a diversity of land use systems. So quantitative analysis uh, are important to understand trends and support land use policies. So the objective of this study was to analyze the effect of pastoral land cover chains on the NEPP-based exergy, the NEPP-X index, in São Paulo State from the year 2000 to 2014. The NEPP-X is an integration of thermodynamics, the exergy analysis, and ecology, the net primary production, the NPP relating variation in biomass surface with the use efficiency of the resource. The study area was the São Paulo state. Uh, we used the map biome as early land cover database to analyze land cover change and to extract pasture areas for the years 2000 and 2014. The NEPPX index, index was estimated in these pasture areas based on the, on the NEPP image from mode sensor and uh, uh, exergy conversion factor. Then using the land cover and the NEPPX maps, we analyzed the transition between pasture lands and the other categories and the uh, spatial dynamics of uh, the land use efficiency. Uh, one of the results was that uh, the pasture covering during this period decreased uh, about 38% between 2000 to 2014, mainly for changes from pasture to semi-perennial crops. Pasture land showed the uh, low efficiency, low NPPX values, with similar behaviors of spatial distribution between these years, with a slight increase from the average, average values. So as a uh, general conclusion, the main land cover change was from pasture to semi-perennial crops. Low biome biomass efficiency in the pasture lands persisted during this period, which highlights the necessity of analyzing pasture land cover dynamics and their influence on land use policy. Thank you. Okay, let's see the three finalists. Congratulations for your excellent work. Um, and now the grand finale. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce that the winner of this category was Dr. Mateus Aparecido Pereira Cipriano. Congratulations, Mateus. Hi, everyone. It was a nice surprise to know that my group award. We want to thank everybody, especially the Be Best team. For us, it was a pleasure to to share with you a little bit of our work here in Agronomic Institute of Campinas in this very nice event. 
that is the best, so important for us in our research. So thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Mateus. It's a great pleasure for everyone here to see the work that you are doing in your labs. Well, now we are, we'll go back to Clarissa, who will give us an overview of this conference. Thank you, Marcelo. We are almost at the end of the session, the last one of our virtual segment. I would like to congratulate all of the participants, finalists and winners who have partnered up with us in this new virtual format and have turned our efforts in, into a complete success with minor, minor glitches. Prior to this virtual segment of the Be Best by Your Future conferences, we hosted two successful webinars that had a total of 695 participants as live audience and that gathered until this morning 660 views on YouTube. In case you missed it, you can find them in the Luva app and in the Be Best by the Future YouTube channel. These numbers were an early sign that we could pull this virtual segment off while we wait for our face-to-face -face meetings next May. And indeed, we had almost 500 attendees in the first two days, as mentioned by Glaucia. Besides the almost 150 posters that Louisiana mentioned, that total almost eight hours of content, we had in the last three days extended sessions which are exclusive to you, registered participants. Even though we certainly had to adapt to the current global scenario, we can say we actually enjoyed some of the advantages of a virtual event. For instance, we had an expressive international audience of 302 individuals in almost 40 countries. These high numbers certainly benefited from our virtual format. Another virtual advantage is that you still have a chance to view all this exclusive content in the WUVA app, as well as the possibility of getting in touch with all the people that took part of this process. Once again, thank you all. I would like now to give the floor to Glaucia, who will close this last session of our virtual segment. Thank you all. With this, we finish the virtual segment of our conference. I'd like to thank uh, our master sponsor, Apex, FAPESP, the Biofuture Platform, the US Office of Naval Research Global, the BioN Program, the Society of Bioenergy, the Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Agronomical Institute of Campinas, the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials, the University of Sao Paulo, the University of Campinas, the International Energy Agency, the World Bioenergy Association, and ADG. And finally, I'd like to thank my conference co-chairs, Luis Augusto Horta Nogueira and Renato Godinho, the General Secretaries, Luisiana Ferreira, Clarissa Foretti and Marcelo Menossi, the president of the local committee, Flavia Vinci, Cynthia Bando, in the name of all the SBBQ team, Vanessa Pereira, in the name of all the ADG team, FAPESP Agency of Communication, Rafael Ribeiro and Eitor Cantarella, our treasurers, and a special thanks to all members of the BioN program, the Be Best Advisory, the Be Best Program Committee and MRE that worked very hard to put together the conference program. I will see you in six months in May for the co full conference. Have a wonderful end of the year. Muito bom. Ah, os quatro ganhadores. Uma foto dos quatro ganhadores. Ah, that's great. Smile for the camera. Congratulations. Very Congratulations, good, very good. everyone. We are very proud of you. Sure, sure we are. Certainly. See you all in May. See you. Bye-bye.
Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Apex Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Apex Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação, a Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse a Apex Brasil. Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Apex Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Apex Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação. A Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse Apex Brasil.